Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Moss Show where we talk about the decentralized revolution, of course, each and every week, talking about the way the world is changing through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Now, I try to bring to you some of the latest breaking news headlines every single week, and that's what we are going to talk about right now. There has been a lot going on. Now, like I said, I like to focus on politics, finance, and technology, but only at the intersection of those three things. We don't try to talk about those things on their own. We want to give you the context you need. Now, of course, as I talk about each and every week, it's technology that changes things more than anything. Technology is what changes the way the world works. And so the, the technology that's driving change right now is Bitcoin, is the decentralized technology that's bringing us this decentralized revolution I, I talk about each and every week. And, you know, when I talk about Bitcoin and this new technology that it's, that, that's building off of that, you know, I don't typically talk about the price of Bitcoin. As I talk about a lot, I think that the price is, uh, is, a, is a distraction. When you're looking at brand new technologies, you don't want to look at the price. You want to look at, um, you want to look at either, well, both. You want to look at the growth of the network. You're looking for network effects. Um, you're looking for the growth of the network, and you're looking for development on the network. Those are two things that you want to see, and we are seeing that in a really big way. Uh, and a couple ways that you can measure this, I mean, obviously, we're looking at users, the growth of the network, and that'd be the amount of users. So that's uh, the, the amount of wallets that we have, but it's also the amount of um, stores or companies or merchants that accept it. But we also look at the, the network itself, which is the mining capacity of the network. How many computers are plugged into the network are helping process transactions, helping to secure the network. And we can see that it has hit a brand new all time high. As a matter of fact, um, you measure it. So in a computer, you would measure it by the hash rate. That's the power of the computer. And you can look at the total amount of hash rate being put into the Bitcoin network. And we just passed 300 equihash. Now, I'm not going to break down what that really means, but just know it's a really big number. But more importantly, it took only about one year for the Bitcoin mining hash rate to gain 100 uh, equihash. So to go from two to 300. So uh, over a 30% increase in the size of the network in just a year. It's a pretty big deal, really, really big deal. Now, we can see that uh, part of that was, I think, really led by China getting rid of a lot of the mining. A lot of it was uh, the, the, the price of Bitcoin had gone up so much that a lot of companies took out big loans. But either way, um, right now we are seeing the, the, the network itself get into new levels that we haven't seen before, which is pretty cool. And we can see that it's also growing in terms of its reach of the amount of people using it and even, like I said, stores and merchants and even countries. Now, we've talked a lot about um, El Salvador being the first nation to make Bitcoin legal tender, which I think is a little bit, uh, I mean, like, kind of like, who cares? Like, they made it legal tender. That's cool. I mean, I'm glad they did that. It brings a lot of attention to it. Um, but anybody can accept Bitcoin if they want. It doesn't have to be recognized as legal tender for it to be used here in the United States. I hear people talking about, we need to make it legal tender in the U.S. It's like, no, we don't. Like, anybody, any store, any service provider could just accept Bitcoin if they want right now. We don't need to do that. But uh, El Salvador did, and uh, it's worked out pretty well for them. Now, a lot of people say it won't because some the price of the Bitcoin isn't as high as when they first bought it. But it's brought them lots of other benefits, including it's brought them massive amounts of tourism, massive amounts of investment, which more than make up for any potential loss they might have had in some of the Bitcoin they bought. Uh, but what we can also see is that while this is happening and while it's in starting to influence other nations to do the same, remember, growth of the network, other nations are starting to do this. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the central bank above all the central banks does not like this. They don't like it as all, at all. As a matter of fact, they've been threatening El Salvador <laughs> many times, um, we're not going to give you any more money. We won't give any more loans. We won't bail you out unless you drop Bitcoin. Now we're seeing someone saying the IMF, um, they're trying to scare other countries away from adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, 
ever since IMF, uh, I'm sorry, ever since El Salvador um, established that legal legal framework, the IMF has been trying to attack it and shut it down. They don't want other companies to do that or other countries to do this, but it doesn't matter. It is growing. And as a matter of fact, El Salvador just grew into the United States. Interesting enough, they are planning to open an embassy in Texas, not just an embassy, though, a Bitcoin embassy. The Central American country, El Salvador, wishes to open a Bitcoin embassy in the new ally of Texas. <clears throat> and this will ex aid the expansion and commercial of economic exchange projects. Now, Texas has sort of become the uh, Bitcoin capital of the United States, maybe even the Bitcoin capital of the world, partly because Texas is probably uh, one of the most, if not the most, uh, pro-freedom states in the United States, um, but also because of the massive amounts of energy that they have. And so Bitcoin needs energy. It needs mine. The miners need the, the power to run off of. And so uh, Bitcoin has really found its home there in, in Texas. So it kind of makes sense that um, they would want to set up an embassy in Texas. Now, they're not just doing it in Texas. As a matter of fact, um, El Salvador also agreed to open a similar um, embassy in Lugano, Switzerland in October with the aim of encouraging adoption of Bitcoin across Europe. You know, it's sort of, uh, we have to kind of think about um, the game theory and how this plays out, right? And so like any new technology, you have um, the first mover advantage, we'll just say. And uh, El Salvador certainly leading on that. And of course, then what will be the next country to adopt it? And that's the race that we're seeing right now. And another big news, remember, we're looking at the growth of the network, but we're also looking for development on the network. And another, a big piece of development that happened on the network was this week, we got Bitcoin ordinals, which brought NFTs. Now, if you love NFTs, like I know a lot of you do, now there's NFTs happening on the Bitcoin blockchain. This is real. It's done through what's called inscriptions, and so some updates, some upgrades on the Bitcoin network have allowed uh, people to now put this code into there. Um, and right now they're putting JPEGs. They're putting NFT transactions into this. Miners have earned nearly 600000 in two months from these NFT projects, these ordinals that have been on there. And so a lot of people would say, well, what happens to the Bitcoin miners when there's no more Bitcoin to be mined? And the answer is always, well, um, transaction fees. So Bitcoin miners earn from transaction fees and from receiving new mined coins. If there's no mined coins, then they get transaction fees. And a lot of people say, well, will that be enough? Well, we don't know. We'll find out in 100 years. But will that be enough? Well, now we see that this is another really big source of revenue for these Bitcoin miners. Now, uh, there's a lot of controversy about this. Do we really need JPEGs and NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain? The answer is we don't know. My opinion is right now sort of like a wait and see. Let's see what happens. I think um, the free market will figure this out. Um, whatever seems to be the highest and best use case, whatever seems to have uh, the best monetary incentives will probably win. But think beyond what this means for just NFTs and JPEGs. I mean, I don't think JPEGs need to be on there. But what about other types of things like, for example, 3D printed gun schematics? Right. So as, uh, of course, every nation wants to get rid of guns so they can put their people into oppression. Most of the world doesn't have them. And now we can print them with 3D printers. And all you got to do is download the code. But of course, they don't want you to have the code. They're trying to delete that everywhere. And if I could store that 3D printed gun schematic, that code into the Bitcoin blockchain, the only censorship resistant and immutable blockchain, what could that do for the power balance of humanity? I think it'd be pretty big. Now, that's just one example. We don't know. Humans are no good at imagining the future, so we don't know really where this takes us. What we do know is this is a new building block. What we do know is we're finding new ways to develop on the Bitcoin blockchain, including ordinals. You know, um, talking about this decentralized revolution, always sticking on that theme, of course, looking at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. I like to look at the, the latest breaking news so we can see how this is developing and one thing that we saw this week was 
a lot of action coming from the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. And it's not surprising, not surprising to me. Uh, I've talked about extensively on this show and on my main YouTube channel, Mark Moss, um, and on lots of other shows, including Fox Business. I've talked extensively about how the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and the, just the U.S. government overall was going to come and really start crimping and clamping down on cryptocurrencies. Um, they, they have to do this because they look horrible. In my opinion, the SEC should shut down and disgrace their job. Uh, there used to be that thing, it was like uh, you had one job. The SEC's one job is to protect consumers. That's their job, protect consumers. How well have they done? Did they protect them from Celsius? Did they protect them from FTX? And the answer is, of course not. Millions and millions of people lost everything, lost their entire life savings. They did nothing to protect them. They failed at their one job. They should shut down in disgrace and walk away in shame. But of course, they're not doing that. And instead, now they have to come back and try to, uh, you know, regain some confidence. And now they're going to come way too heavy handed, of course, right? Of course. And so here they are with the heavy hand coming after anything and everything that evenly seeming like it has nothing to do with securities at all. So what am I talking about? Well, uh, the SEC is now slapping lawsuits just left and right. You got one, you got one, you got one, right, 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 boom, boom, boom. And they just, they, uh, they, they went after uh, Kraken um, and Kraken said, hey, we're not even going to fight you. Here's $30 million, you know, just go away kind of a thing. Um, they came after um, a company called Paxos, which is a stable coin. So meaning you give me a dollar, I give you a dollar token back, and then you can exchange the token back for a dollar whenever you want. Uh, there's lots of stable coins that are out there. And most people have thought this is actually pretty good for the government. It's good for the United States. It's good for the Fed. It's good for the dollar because it makes more people use dollars. So now if you're in a country like Nigeria or in Turkey or in Argentina and you're in a currency that's losing 100% of its value, losing everything, you need to get out of that currency as fast as you can. And what do you get into? Well, you can't get dollars, but what you could do is get a U.S. dollar stable coin, which is basically the same thing. And so it, all it does is get more people in the world into dollars. Now, indirectly through a dollar stablecoin, but it doesn't matter. Either way, it's the same thing. More people are using dollars than they were before. That should be a good thing. However, the SEC, one little arm of the government, is now coming after um, stablecoins. As a matter of fact, they sued this company called Paxos, which is interesting because Paxos is one of the most... Um, regulated and uh, licensed companies. So not only are they in the United States and regulated and licensed in the U.S., they're also um, regulated and direct, uh, under the New York Department of Financial Services, the NYDFS, which is the most, uh, the most restrictive, the hardest jurisdiction to get licensed in, and they're licensed there. And they're going after them for this stablecoin, uh, which is interesting because they're saying it's a security, but it, there's no expectation of profit. Like, I'm giving you a dollar, you're giving me a dollar token. When I give you the token back, you give me my dollar back. I don't expect you to give me a dollar 25. So I don't even know how it fits under that. I don't really care. I'm not a legal attorney. I'm not going to get into that. But what's interesting is that, is that um, well, one, it, it, it's taking away the dollar's dominance again, right? Um, which, which is strange. And it's interesting because... Like I said, they should want that to happen, but they're but they're seemingly taken away. So at a, at a time when we want the dollars, um, the dollar to take off, we want, when when the U.S. government would want the dollar to be stronger, would want more people to use the dollar. Um, you would think it'd be good. The problem is that now that the u.s government is coming after this so hard specifically really the sec is coming after it but even the u.s government um, the u.s government is attacking tether which is the largest stable coin seemingly um it looks like the government the sec etc is trying to choose winners um and it looks like they've picked the winner which they want circle which is usdc to reign supreme that's the one they control and anything that's not usdc they want to attack so they're going after tether um, they went after paxos because of the binance usd the busd so anything that's not circle they want to attack but what's interesting about it is that they could be shooting themselves in the foot as a matter of fact binance ceo binance is the largest cryptocurrency exchange out there in the world 
The CEO CZ says that the industry, the crypto industry, may start to use stable coins pegged to the euro, the yen, or the Singapore dollar instead of the U.S. dollar. Hmm. It says uh, it will probably start using these other currencies um, in the future, reducing its reliance on the U.S. dollar-based stable coins, according to Binance CEO CZ. Um, he said that uh, he said that uh, they could even even they could even start using gold as a standard of value instead of the U.S. dollar. He says, quote, I think that the given the current pressure and current stances taken by the regulators on the U.S. dollar based stable coins, I think that, as you said, the industry will probably move away to non U.S. dollar based stable coins. So you would think the U.S. would want the stable coins to be used because it puts more of the world into the dollar, which is what they want at a time when you have Russia and China and the BRICS nations trying to de-dollarize. We're getting the in, the governments can de-dollarize, but the people could get back into dollars when they weren't able to get dollars before. Now they can because of the stable coins. That is what they want. But the problem is, is that they're so restrictive. They're so heavy handed. They're kicking so many people out that these crypto companies could just say, well, fine, we won't use the U.S. dollar now. We'll use the, the yen. We'll use the euro. Uh, we'll use gold. Something that you can't censor us from. And so it's interesting, um, I guess... It shouldn't be surprising. It's not surprising to me. That's how the government works. And, and, and ultimately, that's how all of this decentralized revolution works. So the more they squeeze to try to retain power, the more they try to censor us because they don't like what we're saying, the more they try to restrict our movement, restri restrict our movement of money, the more they do that, the more we look for solutions to get around those restrictions. And the more we get around them, the more they squeeze. And the more they squeeze, the more we push back. And the more we push back, the more they squeeze. And it's this never-ending cycle. And so they're leading their own demise. They're doing their own marketing for them. And so at a time when you would think they would want more people using the dollar and they're trying to protect their own interests, what they're probably going to do is shoot themselves in the foot and push more people away. Interesting. But um, something I was talking about this week was uh, this train crash that happened in uh, Ohio. And um, I'm not going to get into all that. If you want to know more about what I think about that train, the, the train derailment in Ohio and the chemical spill and all that, um, I just did a video on my main YouTube channel. Go check it out. But um, what I talked about at the end really seemed to have struck a nerve with a lot of people. And what I talked about at the end was I, I called it the age of incompetence. And what happens is at the end of an empire, whether it's a 200, typically a 250-year lifespan of an empire or a 250-year um, lifespan of a, of a democracy, it goes through uh, six or really eight distinct stages um, from cradle to grave. And we're in this last kind of final stage, and, and I'm calling it the age of incompetence. People really like that, seem like, anyway. And what am I talking about? Well, you know, when it comes to um, Southwest Airlines in December having the largest outage, having to cancel every single flight, it's never happened before. Then the FAA had to shut down every single flight in the U.S. Um, because of uh, some software problem. Uh, then it happened in, I think, Canada and Australia. Uh, you know, planes can't seem to run on time anymore. Trains can't seem to run. Trains are derailing. Trucks are overturning. Uh, you know, we have food processing plants seemingly catching on fire, blowing up all the time, Fu fuel refineries, and um, it could be an attack. A lot of people think it is. Uh, a lot of people think it's maybe, you know, some uh, environmentalists or maybe even our own government doing these types of things. Maybe it's another country trying to do these things. Uh, maybe it's the open border and the five million people that have come across and a few terrorists have come across and they're sabotaging our critical, crit 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 critical infrastructure. If you were going to uh, do that, you would certainly attack high-value targets, like where the train derailed right ne next to a river. Um, so it could be that. However, it could also just be because of the age of incompetence. And so what, what do I mean by that? What it will, I mean, at the end of an empire, you have um, basically failing infrastructure. Those railroads, those locomotives, those, uh, the FAA software, the FAA towers, like that's old. That's 60, 70, 80 years old technology. Um, we haven't updated that in a long time. The planes, they're old. We haven't updated them. Um, and so, you know, the fuel refiners, some of these fuel refiners in the United States are 100 years old. Like, <laughs> it's not going to work very good after 100 years, right? And so we're, we have this aged country, this aged infrastructure. But on top of that, we also have people who are incompetent. 
So, um, and, and, and it's caused by any number of reasons. We have obviously in the train situation, they all tried to uh, walk off the job. The Biden administration forced them back on the job. So maybe they're not happy. Uh, they don't feel respected. They don't feel fulfillment in their job. So they're disengaged. But it's also because of the way that we raise these kids. I saw this week uh, another, another big airline, Lufthansa. They had lots of uh, flights delayed. Uh, a German, German's flagship airline carrier, also the same thing, uh, because their um, internet cables were severed. And again, uh, you know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're investigating whether this was due to a cyber attack. So it was an attack or was it, uh, you know, did the fiber just go bad? We don't know. But back to the point, we're seeing this happening more and more and more. And I think a lot of it has to do with this age of incompetence. And I saw these headlines that really caught my eye and really kind of got me angry. And so I thought I would just talk about them if you want to hear me go on a little bit of a rant. But basically, I saw this article um, and it was uh, about Baltimore's uh, failing schools. And um, Baltimore's parent demands action after 23 schools report no math proficiency. <laughs> Let me say that again. All of Boston schools had, quote, no math proficiency. It's a systematic failing is what it says here. Uh, this is a really big deal. So they went through all these schools um, and they looked at all of them. They did the tests or whatever. And none of the students can pass math. Maryland State Department of Educator, Education's 2022 state test results indicated the bombshell findings that no students, no, no students across 23 schools were proficient in math. Well, let me ask you a question. What are schools supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be teaching. What are they supposed to be teaching? Now, I thought they were supposed to teach us how to read and write and do math. Math, science, English, history, they should be teaching us those things. But here, no students, no, none, no students across all 23 schools were proficient in math. So what, what are they doing? Well, over here, you think that's bad. Over here we have Chicago. Not a single student, again, not a single, not one, nobody, not a single student is proficient in reading or math at 55 Chicago schools. Not a single student in 55 schools, not one student met grade level expectations in either math or reading during the 2021-22 school year. Out of 649 schools, what are they supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be teaching. Now, we can argue what they're supposed to be teaching, but if you don't think that math <laughs> and uh, reading are like probably the two of the most important ones at the very top of the pile, then we, don't, we, we have no conversation. Math, if you can't read and write and perform math, like you failed. As a matter of fact, I think most high school is pretty much pointless. Once you learn how to read and write and do math, like you're kind of done. But they can't even teach that. But what are they teaching? Well, they're teaching how to be woke. They're teaching that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. They're teaching that there's no difference in biological sex. They're teaching that men can get pregnant. They're teaching preschoolers and kindergartners and elementary kids about transgenderism. Here where I'm at in California, maybe I would say that one of maybe some of the worst school districts, but now that I see this about the Chicago and Baltimore, I'm not so sure. But here, here in California, in the middle schools, in the middle schools, they're putting tampons in the boys' bathrooms. In a city, uh, two cities over from where I'm at, in the schools, they're putting litter boxes in the bathrooms. Litter boxes in the bathrooms. Now, why would they put litter boxes? Well, who uses litter boxes? Cats use litter boxes. Cats. So why would they put litter boxes in the bathrooms? Well, it's for the students that identify as cats, of course. Like, what? <laughs> like, hang on a second. Well, hang on a second. Th this, is, this is for real, all right? This is not a joke. I'm serious. So students think they're cats, and the teachers oblige this by putting litter boxes in the bathrooms. They're supposed to be teaching. Like, how about, no, you're not really a cat. You're actually a human. How about that? How about that would be something we should teach? 
I mean, when I was in school, biology, I guess, was a lot different than it is now. I guess we weren't as woke, but we understood that humans and animals were different. We were not the same. Um, pigs, we, we dissected pigs because cl pigs were supposed to be the closest to humans. <laughs> not cats. We're not cats. How about as a teacher, like, hey, sorry, student, you're not a cat. You're just not, right? You're, you're not a unicorn. Uh, you're, you're, you're a person. You're a kid. How about that? You're a boy. You're a girl. Uh, and you should go to the bathroom using a urinal or a toilet like everybody else. Maybe we should teach them how to use urinals. We're, we're, we're school. We're supposed to teach them. But no, instead of teaching them math, not a single student in Chicago is proficient in reading or math at 55 schools. Not a single one or Baltimore. Instead of teaching reading and writing and math, we're teaching them that they're a, they're a cat. <laughs> and they should use a litter box and we're putting it in the bathroom. Oh, man, if that doesn't get you mad and fired up, I don't know what will. And this leads to the age of incompetence. Where does this lead us? Does this lead to more skilled workers in the railroad and the airline industry? Does this lead to more trains and planes running on time and breaking down? No, this is the age of incompetence. Now, the good news is for you and I, all you got to do is be above average and you could crush it. You don't have to work that hard. I talked about last week, uh, but it's continued to dominate the news headlines, so we're going to talk about it again a little bit, and that is the balloons, the Chinese balloons that are flying over the United States. What does all of this mean? Well, we don't really know <laughs> because we can't really get a straight answer out of anybody, and what happens is when we don't get straight answers out of anybody, then it leads to lots of speculation. Now, it would lead to speculation anyway, but in this case, we're getting lots of speculation. And we went from having one balloon to two balloons to three balloons to four balloons. And I've seen lots of different reports. I've spent a lot of time looking at this more than I should have. Um, and it seems like um, some people say that they were actually very sophisticated spy balloons. And that they didn't really get any information from us because as they were flying over, they were trying to get uh, pictures of our um, ballistic missile um, and uh, nuclear um, <coughs> uh, military bases that we have. But as they saw them coming across, uh, they just kind of closed up the, the doors and they didn't really see anything. That's I see some. And some say maybe they weren't so sophisticated. Maybe they weren't doing anything. Um, Based off of all the data I've been able to gather, I err on more of the side of they were sophisticated, at least some of them were, and they were trying to capture this data, and, and, we, and we shot them down. But it's interesting for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One, because China first denied them, said, wait a minute, this, this wasn't ours. Um, then they went on to say, uh, wait a minute, uh, now you know, we're going to retaliate because you shot him down. You've flown balloons over the United States a bunch of times, I mean, over China a bunch of times. Um, and so now they're saying that it's, uh, it's, an, it's an attack and now there's going to be retaliation from it. So there's like this, this narrative shift that's happening. And now it seems like as of yesterday, they're trying to, you know, there's been a lot of talk about UFOs. The government seems to be shut, sh shutting down the UFO thing. But now there's almost like this kind of uh, narrative shift where they're saying, well, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's not this. So we don't know. And, and so that's not what I want to talk about. What I do want to talk about, though, is why are we all talking about this? We talk about what they want us to talk about. They being um, the people pulling the strings, the governments uh, who control the, the, the media. So Pretty much all the media, uh, mainstream, so CNN and CNBC and MSNBC and ABC and CBS, they all get their same talking points from one group, and whatever they decide to push is what most people talk about. So the question is, why are we talking about balloons and not talking about other things? Like, for example, the train derailment that happened in Ohio, the, one of the, you know, a massive chemical spill. Um, affecting all the farmland, some of the best farmland in the United States, right on the Ohio River that feeds into the Mississippi River. Like, this is a massive ecological problem um, that could potentially have been an attack. Even if it's not, even if it was an accident, we should probably say that. And we should probably also talk about the damage that's going to happen. We should probably warn people, tell them to put N95 on masks. I mean, you had to wear masks for COVID, but you don't have to wear it for this, apparently. And so the question is, why is no mainstream news talking about that? 
Now, uh, on Twitter, you see it happening. That's where the people talk. Uh, obviously, I'm talking about it. I did a whole vi YouTube video. You can check it out on my main YouTube channel, just Mark Moss. I did a video on it. So people are talking about it, but why is mainstream completely silent? Now, Tucker Carlson on Fox did a piece, but no mainstream news. So the question I ask is, why do they want us talking about these balloons, and why do they not want us talking about the train? The balloons caused no damage. It didn't affect anybody. There's no damage. There's no, no one's house. No one died. No animals are dying. No water was polluted. No farmland was ruined. Um, so why are we talking about balloons? And that's the question that we should be asking. Well, my answer to that is, unfortunately, why do they want us talking about these balloons? Why are they saying they're coming from China? And what is the sentiment they're trying to get us about China? Well, uh, we're mad at China. We're angry at China. China's spying on us. And now they can drum up rhetoric um, or sentiment to beat the drum beats of war against China some more potentially. They're saying that China has more inter, 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 uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles than the U.S. does, so we should probably give more money to the military-industrial complex so they could build more weapons, I guess. Now, the people, we, the people, you and I, we're not going to be happy giving even more money to the military unless we can think that we're really in a big threat here. If we, if we see a big threat, then maybe they could get the people to support giving more money to the military industrial complex. Now, um, I talk about this because what we're seeing is as we move into this decentralized revolution, as we're going from a unipolar world where the U.S. homogeny controls everything to a, a multipolar world with Russia, <laughs> China, this is going to lead to us not all being friends anymore. This is going to lead go from a place of global cooperation, we're all friends, to now competition. Instead of cooperation, it's competition. And unfortunately, war is one of those things. And so now it's a competition of who has the most weapons, who has the most determined systems, and all those things. And we can see this in a lot of different areas. We can see um, this week that apparently the Philippines now, China... <coughs> China apparently attacked the Philippines, shining some laser lights in their, in, in their eyes. There's like this laser report talking about how um, Chinese boats um, went after uh, Philippine um, boats and shined lasers in the eyes, causing temporary blindness, uh, blindness, saying this is that uh, it's, it's a, they, made, they, they did very dangerous maneuvers in the water, blocking the delivery of food and supplies, and this is like a direct attack on the Philippines. So now the Philippines and the United States are going to join together. The U.S. is going to protect the Philippines. Now we're carrying out um, the biggest joint military drills since 2015. So Washington is redoubling its efforts to go against China and to now ally with Philippines. So we're allying with the Taiwan, we're allying with the Philippines, and to, you can see what's happening here, right? As this world is breaking apart, everybody's scrambling to find out who's on whose team. And maybe some of this is even being done to even build that sentiment even more. So now, supposedly, the Philippines got attacked by China, and so now the U.S. is going to side. now the Philippines will come to side with China. Now, they, I'm sorry, with the U.S. Now, they could have easily gone and sided with, with China. So we're seeing how all this shakes out, and it's happening in real time. We see that the IMF put out this report this week warning that uh, the world needs to prepare for the unthinkable, they say. It needs to be prepared to better handle shocks and the unthinkable. She referenced uh, Georgina Kristalina, the head of the IMF, referenced the earthquakes in T Turkey and Syria. Saying, hey, we, we got to be ready. We got to be ready. Who knows what, what could happen? And so they're preparing us. They're preparing us. Now, of course, the IMF is preparing a little bit differently. Um, they want to get ready to play a stabilizing role with the money because they're a banker. When all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. And when you're a banker, all, the whole, all you have is money. And it says that uh, they're ready to put in 40 to $48 billion into the Ukraine economy to prepare for this stabilization. So is it all about money? Is it all about war? Is it all over the dollar? 
Right now, we have more questions than answers, but what I can tell you is that the world is decentralizing. We are witnessing the decentralized revolution, and each one of these are signs to show us that we are getting further and further down this road, and we're not coming back. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Mark Moss Show. We talk about the decentralized revolution each and every week, talking about the way the world is breaking apart as we look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. And of course, technology, typically we're talking about Bitcoin, which is the decentralized technology, which is giving us what we need as the world decentralizes. If you missed any of this show, you can catch it on your favorite podcast player. Just search The Mark Moss Show. You can watch and listen on YouTube under Market Disruptors and hit me up on social media at OneMarkMoss. I'd love to hear from you. And that's what I got. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time.